I'd like to talk about the notion of uh, moral responsibility. Um, it is something that uh, human beings have been reflecting about for quite a long time. And sometimes we hear it said that uh, there's been a lot of progress made in the sciences, for example, and yet very little progress has been made in uh, morality itself. Uh, and sometimes uh, this is justified in terms of pointing out that, uh, well, there's still wars and conflicts between uh, human beings uh, up to now. Uh, I think far from, far from uh, suggesting that uh, our knowledge of uh, morality has been uh, backward, uh, I think what that really suggests is the difference between scientific thinking on the one hand and uh, moral reflection. Uh, in a sense, you could have, uh, well, not just in a sense, but definitely you could have experts in science, but uh, you could properly raise the question of whether they really are experts in uh, moral reflection. Uh, so perhaps science and uh, ethics are really two very different uh, areas of uh, human thinking. Uh, one is concerned with reflecting the world uh, to our minds. The other one is concerned with a certain type of uh, action. Uh, so uh, the possibilities of human action have changed uh, so much in the last hundred years or so in terms of the uh, growth in technology, especially in technologies of communication and biomedicine. And so perhaps uh, these developments are responsible for the, the shift in the kinds of moral problems that we face. Uh, moral reflection in the last uh, 2,000 years or so uh, has largely or can be characterized as a search for certain concepts that are uh, of the nature of absolutes. Uh, and perhaps that is one reason why moral reflection can be said to lag behind uh, our understanding of uh, scientific concepts. Uh, and perhaps the very development of uh, technology in our time is responsible for the perceived lag between uh, moral reflection and scientific uh, understanding. Uh, what is necessary perhaps, again, no, is uh, a summing up of the central moral conceptions that we have uh, worked on and a change in our critical perspective on uh, what it is that we are looking for when we reflect about uh, morality. Are we looking for absolutes? Are we looking for constants? And uh, uh, what are the proper sources of moral reflection? Uh, many of our moral concepts, uh, for example, are taken over from uh, areas of human life like uh, religion. Uh, is, it, is it time to change this? Is it time to uh, uh, look at morality again and uh, uh, see and once, for, once and for all get really very clear about what the basis of moral reflection is? and why we are facing all the challenges that we have uh, right now. Surely some of it comes from technology, uh, doesn't it, Peter? Technology does many things to uh, different areas of our, of our life. Uh, but I think we have to distinguish between moral reflection as such and moral conversation because what we're having, uh, especially online and uh, in many places, are pretty much about moral conversations. And, and technology does uh, amplify the conversation. And uh, it's not just amplification in terms of volume, but also speed, all right? And uh, almost, om uh, almost omni, uh, omnipresence uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, reach, for instance, of, uh, of technology. So you see online uh, discussions about what constitutes good behavior or precedent, for instance, what constitutes uh, uh, right action of policemen or ordinary citizens. So more than ever, uh, you have uh, uh, widespread uh, concern for, for morality. 
Yes, but uh, what many of these conversations, uh, I think, uh, often underscore is what to some moral philosophers at least seems like a lack of progress in the way people understand uh, such moral concepts. Uh, another, I, uh, I think, a factor that impinges on our moral conversations is the sheer number of human beings that uh, live today. Uh, it seems that uh, population pressures uh, exert a certain pull on our moral discourses. Uh, so that, uh, that's my basis for saying that uh, perhaps it is more than ever time to reflect upon morality in a more decisive way. I like defining in uh, a very clear and succinct way the notion of moral responsibility and who we are moral, morally responsible uh, to. Uh, so far as philosophical reflection goes, it seems that we have, we have reached a certain limit uh, in our reflection. Uh, we have explored the idea that morality is all about human well-being, human happiness. Uh, we have explored the idea that morality is about duty, or it's about uh, uh, the well-being of the self. Uh, perhaps it's time to put an emphasis on morality as something like a concern for, uh, a pure and unconditional concern for the other, the neighbor. Uh, perhaps our, our times are times in which uh, we can, we are in a position finally to clarify uh, the basis of moral responsibility in the unconditional concern for uh, the neighbor. There have been expressions of this in philosophy, in sociology, uh, in the social sciences. Uh, as a result, uh, most likely of the fact that the world has become, the boundaries, for example, between countries have become more porous. Uh, the nation state is no longer uh, uh, anything is no longer anything that defines human identity once and for all for a complete lifetime. Many human beings find themselves moving from one place of habitation to another in the course of their lives and changing cultures, changing identities. And so, well, there's a lot of uh, emigration taking place, refugees all over the world, uh, mixing up of cultures. And so, in my view, one of the... Uh, one of the most important points to get clear about is the notion of who is the neighbor and what is the nature of our responsibility to the neighbor. Uh, perhaps moral philosophy can bring us to the point where we can engage as many human beings as possible in a conversation, a serious conversation uh, about this. I wonder if the internet can, uh, can help provide the basis for uh, starting a serious global conversation on uh, these questions? Uh, well, I, I think there, there's, there's an argument to be made that overall, uh, for, for, uh, for a long time, we have already uh, been uh, mostly responsible to our neighbors. Uh, for instance, uh, globally, there is a uh, downtrend of, uh, of uh, violence, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, this is supported by empirical data that uh, despite what we see in Syria these days or uh, killings uh, in, in, our, uh, in our society, overall, uh, there is, uh, um, there is down drop, downtrend in, uh, in, uh, in, in violence, for instance. There is universal con uh, condemnation of uh, slavery and there are efforts to, uh, to address these things. So you can say morally we've been uh, responsible, but uh, on the other hand, I, I, I see your uh, discomfort over, uh, say, uh, technology, uh, over the possibility or the prospect of technology being a platform for moral reflection. And I would say uh, the internet is, is, uh, is a collection of tools where uh, there are serious people uh, thinking about, uh, thinking through these, these concerns, these issues, uh, and uh, they've made some progress. But the internet is a mixed blessing, isn't it? Certainly, certainly. Um, you can argue that it's a mixed blessing, but on the other hand, uh, you can look for uh, some kind of a net, net effect. Yeah. Net, uh, and I would say uh, you can, it's, it's, it's probably net, net, uh, net positive. It certainly seems to, to promote a shorter attention spans, and uh, that seems to me to be uh, 
well, that doesn't count very much in favor of uh, serious moral uh, reflection. But on the other hand, uh, you find uh, very serious discussions of uh, moral issues on YouTube, for example. You find serious blogs where people explore moral issues uh, in a very, very detailed way. Uh, so where do we strike a balance between uh, the casual nature of uh, commenting in blogs and uh, the need for serious uh, moral reflection? Can anything be done uh, in the culture of, uh, or rather in the technology of uh, communication to, uh, to make this technology more susceptible to being used uh, for serious moral reflection? Um, there's, there's, there's no uh, shortcut. Uh, I would say that uh, it's also possible to use internet to have a good conversation about the internet as a moral platform or as a platform for, uh, for moral reflection. Uh, for instance, uh, we can encourage our students to tune in to certain channels because if anything uh, that characterizes internet, it's really just this uh, mirad of, uh, of, of channels. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, mm -hmm. It takes some uh, conscious, uh, de uh, deliberate effort to really tune into the right channels. And that one would uh, require uh, a certain level of guidance from adults in the room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And perhaps from the educational system uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Because the internet does not function uh, in an isolated way. It's part and parcel of a larger educational system. Uh, perhaps it is the educational system that can make uh, or that can get students to make use of the internet in a, in a more responsible and uh, intelligent way. Yeah. But it's also a function of media literacy. Australia, for instance, offers media literacy to, uh, to early age so, so that what you see online is not just taken at its face value. And I think that's, that's somewhere there's some, some deficit in our, in, our, in our local setting on, uh, on uh, the way we use the internet because there much, there's not much conscious effort to delineate between authoritative sources and, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, your opinion or simply opinion without without uh, without basis in facts for instance so I think the distinction has to be made uh, it's not just uh, internet as such no no mm -hmm. such thing as the internet it's really more like networks of of, of channels of sources of uh, people talking to each other and the conversation can can crisscross and and that's really the the beautiful thing about uh, internet as a platform for moral conversations uh, of course uh, we, you wanted really this to be a uh, you know, platform for moral reflection or simply conversation, but you know, they, uh, they feed on each other. <laughs> uh -huh. and the, the internet certainly has the advantage of uh, presenting uh, events around the world in a very dramatic, uh, mm -hmm. dramatic way. Uh, images of refugees, images of victims of terrorism. Uh, that certainly has something uh, going for it, but on the other hand, there can be such a thing as, well, fatigue, compassion fatigue, for example, when you uh, look at these images uh, all the time. So I would say the internet uh, is a powerful tool in the right hands and with the right, uh, with the right guidance. Uh, so how would, you, how would you say the prospects of uh, improving uh, the nature of moral reflection in the world stand today with the internet, uh, with the availability of all this uh, technology. I, I gather you're optimistic about it? I am. Uh, 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 I have guarded optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, there is so much to do uh, in the way we use, uh, in, we use uh, technology in general. But uh, for, for philosophers, uh, we ask basic questions just the same, uh, regardless of platform. So we, we go to internet. Uh, also in part to amplify the conversation and to uh, recruit some more uh, moral thinkers, so to speak, so that the conversation is not just uh, monopolized by professors and students, but you have a uh, uh, so-called silent college mm -hmm. where you expand the nature of, of conversation. Uh, and it's really something that goes beyond classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, there's this uh, course in, in ethics uh, with uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. And, 
they're just interlopers, so to speak, uh, in, and many of which are of whom are really just uh, participants, rather, are interlopers in the conversation. So there are uh, massive uh, online courses uh, mm -hmm. for, for, for ethics, and uh, I would say uh, these are great opportunities for, uh, for moral philosophers to engage uh, uh, the world. And in the very participation in these conversations, human beings learn certain, certain norms, norms of civility and rationality, uh, always assuming, of course, that uh, the people who lead the conversations are serious about uh, the topics they uh, introduce and that these, uh, these are matters of great uh, personal concern uh, to them and they're not just using the internet to propagate certain uh, views, no? partisan views. Uh, so, well, I'm inclined to agree with you that uh, there is basis for optimism in uh, today's world. Uh, although there are dangers as well, uh, don't you think? Certainly. Uh, the, the dangers, uh, the, the reception, or perception of risk is also a function of, of comfort, the level of comfort of facilitators of conversation. For instance, teachers uh, need retooling to be able to um, uh, to be able to marshal the conversation well because uh, it's uh, while the internet is uh, is a powerful tool for uh, moral reflection and moral responsibility moral conversation it is also vulnerable to trolls for instance right. to to a lot of noise so mm -hmm. um, so that um, how you skillfully navigate through this uh, through this otherwise noisy environment uh, is quite a challenge for, for moral philosophers. So we are confronted again with the paradox of paradoxes of choice. Uh, because we have the choice, uh, we can use the internet to trivialize our lives. We can also use it, on the other hand, to ennoble it uh, through moral uh, reflection. And, uh, Perhaps we in the academy uh, who study these things, who study ethics from a certain point of view, from a theoretical point of view, uh, perhaps uh, we can also perform a certain role in terms of conceptual guidance of where conversations uh, should go, the directions uh, into which uh, conversations about moral issues in politics, in society, and uh, in the world uh, generally uh, can be taken. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think there is good reason to be optimistic about uh, morals and the connection between moral reflection, moral conversation, and uh, technologies of communication. Mm -hmm. To go back to the question of uh, what role, if any, academics uh, have to play in this, uh, I feel that they have a very important and pivotal role because uh, academics can view the very nature of communication and the development of human values from a uh, theoretical perspective that no one else can because it's their habit to think about these things uh, from that point of view. And so uh, I think the role that they can uh, perform, uh, the essential role for them to perform is to remind people of the uh, proper range of conversations uh, that must take place. And uh, so that uh, the media, uh, the technologies of communication, are not used to manipulate human beings into making uh, choices that they would not ordinarily make, uh, or into making choices that are really against their better reflections. So uh, I, I believe, however, that uh, academics are not pure saviors in this uh, respect. They also have something to do. Uh, it's incumbent upon them to uh, become more familiar with uh, technology. And how do you suppose, Peter, uh, uh, they can do this? Uh, I, I, Especially the older generation of oh, academics uh, uh, who did not grow up with uh, technologies of communication that uh, we uh, certainly uh, academics have a, a pivotal role in in and uh, moral conversations uh, uh, in the face of technological change. But I think uh, 
there is an added requirement for uh, academics to be able to meaningfully uh, engage people, uh, for instance, online. Uh, uh, part of that uh, requirement is really a uh, retooling of academics right. to be able to be adept in the use of, uh, yeah. of, uh, of technologies, for they instance. Have mm -hmm. They have to overcome their reticence about using uh, this new technology. Certainly, uh, they have to be natural, so to speak. And um, the level of media literacy for academics should be higher than, uh, uh, than, than ordinary citizens because uh, uh, you have to be sensitive to, uh, to cues that in, that will enable you to uh, uh, engage uh, in meaningful yes. conversation. Yeah. They and have the capacity for setting the tones of moral conversation. And they can only do that if they, they are, they are well-versed in, uh, in right. the media. That's correct. So I would like to end on uh, the point that uh, there has never been a time when mankind needs so much to reflect, to continue to reflect on the nature of his moral self. Uh, and uh, we find ourselves having to use, uh, for better or for worse, the technology that is available to us, the technologies of communication. And it is up to us to see that as nothing but a hindrance or as something that can potentially enhance that uh, conversation. Uh, I choose to take the second course. Uh, certainly, uh, th that's a good choice for me. But uh, let me just add that uh, the, the role of, uh, of the moral philosopher has never been more important than ever, uh, especially so that uh, there is there's so much need for, for interdisciplinary commerce. Uh, the, the subject of morality has been participated in by various disciplines, psychology, sociology, anthropology. Social and to be able to traffic the conversation, given what, what we do as philosophers, uh, looking at uh, essential themes uh, and uh, inquiring to these themes uh, via the uh, empirical work from psychologists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, you know, and even uh, cognitive sciences on the question of the nature of the good, on the nature of uh, what constitutes uh, moral behavior, I think uh, there is much to be done uh, in this area of uh, being able to uh, facilitate the conversation.